people and you spend a Saturday morning picking up trash with your church family, you are bound to find some really interesting things. A little over a week ago for our spring serve, a bunch of us uh, gathered outside here in the parking lot and we moved alongside the 101 to pick up anything and everything that we could find. Some of the more interesting things that, that we found is uh, I found a pair of headphones just hanging from a plant. One of our elders found a, a wallet with identification and, and credit cards from a teenager from Maine. I found an entire foosball table sitting in the ditch. <laughs> I like, to, uh, I like to imagine how some of these items got there. You have a lot of time to think to yourself when you're picking up trash along the highway. Uh, when I think about the headphones, I think of a brother and a sister sitting in the back seat of the car and a sister grabbing those headphones and chucking them out the window and saying to her brother, you never listen to me. When I think of the wallet, I think of a teenager driving all the way from Maine to see his long-distant girlfriend in Amherst, and he wants to make a really good impression, so he grabs all the trash he can from his front seat and chucks it out the window with his wallet, <laughs> not even knowing that his wallet is there. You can probably guess who paid for dinner that night. And when I think of the foosball table, I, I imagine a father's driving uh, on the way home to see his kids with the table in his back seat, I imagine that he is imagining that he's going to surprise his kids with this really great and wonderful gift when all of a sudden he hits one of these New Hampshire potholes and, <laughs> and all of a sudden there's nothing left in the back of his, of his truck at all. Um, when I think about all of these scenarios, a word that comes to mind to describe all of them is, is the, word, the word disappointment. The sister was disappointed in her brother, who always seemed to be aloof, and the brother was disappointed that he no longer had his headphones. Um, the teenager was disappointed, of course, that he lost his wallet, and uh, his, his girlfriend was disappointed that uh, she had to pay for lunch that day. Um, the father was disappointed that he didn't have his gift to share, and the children were disappointed that there was there was nothing in the back of his truck. We all experience troubles of various kinds. Jesus even said that in the Bible. He said, in this world, you will have troubles. But the trouble of disappointment seems to have a particular, kind of a particular sting to it. Most of us know that the world is broken and that, uh, that, <clears throat> that we're going to face all sorts of difficulties. And sometimes some of us even see that brokenness, we see, it in our, we see it in ourselves. So we don't always necessarily trust everyone or trust everything to, to work out. But there's a part of us subconsciously, there's, we all have this place that we put aside and we just assume that this place is going to be safe. We buy a brand new car, maybe, for those of you who do that sort of thing, and uh, you expect it to work and get you by for a couple of years without having to put any major repairs into it. Uh, you look at your kids and you say, my kids would never do something like that. <laughs> or you consider yourself and you consider that, and you say, I, I would never do something like that either. What makes disappointment so difficult sometimes for us is that it's unanticipated. Uh, we, we just simply, we don't, we don't expect it to come. Uh, maybe you have heard the phrase, it's always darkest just before the bottom falls out. <laughs> and things, they fall apart. That's what makes disappointment so bad. What makes disappointment so bad is we don't see it coming. And that's frustrating. A couple of weeks ago, I was going out to start our van that we had been trying to sell for a long time because I had a buyer that was interested in it the next day. Wanted to make sure it started. I hadn't started it in a week or two, and uh, <laughs> you don't want to leave a bad impression when you first try to turn the key and the van doesn't turn over. I've had a lot of difficulties with that van. 
It's been a liability. It's just sat there for a long time. We, we've been eager to get rid of it so that we could have some parking space. But as it sat there, I, I needed help to uh, replace the battery. And then I needed help to remove the rust off of the rotors. Problem after problem. And uh, it was very difficult to find buyers. So finally, I had somebody interested. And I stepped outside. I turned the key. And it, it started. Wonderful. Great. I kind of walk around and do the inspection, and I, I pull the sliding door open, and all of a sudden the sliding door sticks halfway. So I, I tug a little bit backwards, nothing. I tug a little bit forwards, and then I tug backwards and forwards. And by, by this time now, the van is rocking. <laughs> but the door is not budging. I was <laughs> really frustrated, to say, to say the least. I, 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 uh, I didn't know what to do. And to be honest, there was probably a part of me that blamed God for that. It's unfortunate because I don't think uh, there are a lot of vans that are hot on the market with halfway open doors. <laughs> Maybe I could have pitched it like as a breezeway or something <laughs> like that. I called uh, one of our church gyms who has helped me out uh, in the past with some of the car difficulties, and uh, I said to him, I'm looking at the river that sits in front of our house, and I said to him, um, Jim, do you think it would be easier to drive this to a junkyard or just drive it in the river? <laughs> he could sense the disappointment in my voice. I blamed, I was, I was frustrated, and I, I blamed God. There is a part of me that, there's a part of me that said, you know, you've been a Christian for 15 years. You've been to seminary. Don't you know better than that? The truth is, I do know better than that. But I don't always feel better than that. Disappointment, it comes to us. It comes to us all. How can we overcome when disappointment comes our way? How can we rise above it? How can we, how can we experience life beyond disappointment? In John chapter 4, in one of the most uh, famous encounters Jesus has in the entire Bible, he, he encounters a woman who has had a life full of disappointments. And, and we're going to look at that in, in just a bit. But I want to take a moment with you and just kind of take a deeper dive and consider a little bit more this, this problem we have of disappointment and some of the ways that we choose to cope with disappointment. One of the ways we choose to cope with disappointment, uh, we try to anticipate it, is we try to live life a little bit more cautiously. This is the avoid risks at all costs approach to protecting ourselves from disappointment. Uh, people who take this approach uh, may always eat the, the same kind of food. They might be a little bit of a little bit stingy with their finances. They may, they may avoid travel abroad for any, any reason. And the truth is that Jesus, he, he tells us that we should be cautious, especially in dangerous situations. Uh, Jesus said that we should be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. So there is value to being cautious. But sometimes we can be overly cautious, and being overly cautious may inhibit, may inhibit our faith, may inhibit uh, acts of uh, trust. Um, and, and truthfully, it, may, it may, may prevent us from experiencing joy that we would have otherwise experienced uh, had we not taken those, those risks of faith. And honestly, disappointment still finds its way, it finds its way in the form of disease, in the, in the form of heartbreak, or in the form of loss. Another way that we try to cope with disappointment is very similar. Sometimes we just set our expectations really, really low so that we won't be disappointed or that we won't be hurt by people. And this is something that I'm um, personally a little bit more inclined to. I, I set my expectations low. I don't look down on people, but I just don't necessarily sometimes expect a lot, and it's the selfish thing so that I'm not let down by those people. Well, there is some value to setting our expectations low. In fact, uh, Jesus himself, John, records this, the gospel writer of Jesus. Uh, he, said, he said of Jesus, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people, 
He did not need anyone, any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Later in the book of John, Jesus does some miracles, and people follow him all around the Sea of Galilee, really a lake. They follow him all around the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus explains, not really because they wanted to know more about his teachings or his way of life, but because they wanted more food after he had reproduced all of that uh, for them and the miracle of the, of the splitting of the bread. So there, there is value to keeping our expectations low. But low expectations can also inhibit our relationships. If we never give somebody the benefit of the doubt, we don't really build trusting, meaningful relationships with people. It can also inhibit our hope. If we keep our expectations so low, we really, we really don't necessarily have something good to look forward to. The third coping mechanism that we sometimes, we sometimes utilize when we consider this, this problem of disappointment is we, we turn to stuff. We turn to, we turn to things. Uh, there's some Christians, they, they, you might say that we, we drown ourselves in our sorrows. Some Christians turn to alcohol and, and get drunk um, in closed doors because it's not publicly acceptable. Others turn to pornography or, or, or drugs or, or things that aren't necessarily inherently harmful like, like video games or, or news or whatever that thing is that we, we consume and we consume and we consume because it kind of makes us feel good. It pulls us away from the world and it, it helps us to avoid facing the pain of disappointment. We consume and we consume and it consumes us. The irony is, is that we do that to try to feel a little bit more peace. But when we become consumed by these things, we end up feeling less and less peace. When disappointment happens in our lives, uh, it leaves us feeling thirsty and hungry. Hungry for, for something more. This is something that the characters in, in the Bible experienced quite a bit. The people that John was writing to, uh, they, were, they were let down by their community. They were kicked out of the Jewish synagogues, John implies. Uh, so because of they, they were kicked out because of Jesus. So they were let down by their community. Some characters, some people in the Bible were let down by, by their friends. Of course, we all are familiar with the story of, of Judas and I can only imagine how the disciples, let alone Jesus, but the disciples felt by somebody within their community turning on them. And there are people in the Bible who were just let down by themselves. Moses, as he, as he approached the end of his life, he looked over and he saw the promised land that he was told that he would inherit. But because he failed God, he was looking over at a land a physical land that he would not receive. Sometimes it's the oh-so-close ones that really sting the worst. Well, Jesus encountered a woman in Samaria who had, who had gone through a life full of, of disappointments. Now, this is what's said about her. She had, we, we find this in a surprising way, actually, about halfway through the story. It's said that she had five husbands, and the one that she was with was not her own. Now, there's a little bit of mystery to this statement. It's easy to assume a lot about that. What may have happened is <clears throat> she may have had husbands who had simply died. Uh, some of those husbands may have left for no fault of her own. And then perhaps also she made some mistakes. And maybe there's a combination of all of those. Possibly the reason that she's with a man that is not her husband right now is because she doesn't want to go through the failure experience the disappointment of marriage again. She was disappointed, I imagine, in God. She was disappointed in men. Perhaps, perhaps she was disappointed in herself, too. One of the most interesting things about this story is we don't find about her disappointment until about halfway through the story. And that's not normal. Usually we kind of get the details up front. We kind of get it, we get to know who this character is 
before we see this character in action. And I think that the reason that John withholds those details and lets Jesus reveal them is because he wants us to know that that person, that woman, could be just like the person sitting next to you today. Could be just like you as well. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open up with me. We'll read along on the screen to John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sukkar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me to drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would, have given, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't, be, so that I won't get thirsty and, ha and have to come here to, to draw water. He, t he told her, Go, call your, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have five husbands, and the man that you have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Samaria was situated in between, in between Judea and Galilee, where Jesus did most of his ministry. We don't know why Jesus had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. There was another route. It just said that that he had to, without, without explanation. Well, a little bit of history to understand what Samaria was and a little bit of background to this relationship. Samaria was part of the kingdom of Israel before it split. And then the kingdom split into Judea and it split into Israel, which was the northern part um, after, after the time of Solomon. Well, eventually the northern kingdom was attacked by the empire called Assyria, uh, some of them were taken into captivity, some were left, and the Assyrians sent their own people to occupy that territory. They, they intermixed, and eventually the Israelite religion of the northern kingdom, which became Samaria, kind of became mixed as well. They followed some parts of the Old Testament, but they rejected others, including rules about only having one temple and where that temple should be located. So they built their own temple, as you see. In the midst of this conversation with with Jesus, we learned that the Samaritans, just like the Jews, were expecting a Messiah. 
But I think this woman, she tests Jesus by, asks, by bringing up the whole situation of the place where your temple should be at. She tests him, I think, because she wants, she wants to know what side are you on, Jesus? What side are you on? Well, Jesus answers and surprisingly says, well, there's going to come a time when it's not going to be about the place that you worship. Uh, you're gonna, it's going to be about how you worship in spirit and in truth. And I think by implication, he's also saying this. The Messiah isn't going to just belong to one group of people. He's going to belong to all groups of people. He says that he's the Messiah, and after this story that we just read, she goes off and she tells the townspeople, she shares her testimony, and they accept it. They accept it in ways that the Jews have not accepted it so far. They come, they meet Jesus, and the story concludes with a statement from the Samaritan people who say, surely this one is the Savior of the world. This story is here to show that Jesus is for all people. Jesus is for all people. But there's also a really personal story here. There's a personal story of Jesus and this woman. This woman who has lived a life as we kind of, kind of see through that revelation of, of disappointment. She's cynical. She's bitter. She's thirsty. So Jesus, spotting her, he asks, he asks her for a drink. And... Uh, <laughs> She bites back. She says, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? John tells us it's because the Jews and the Samaritans, they, they weren't friendly. They did not associate with each other. I imagine that Jesus smiled at that. And he gets a little bit bold. And he responds to the woman who just bit at her and says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink... You would have asked him. You would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. Well, the woman, as you imagine, scoffs. She scoffs. Jesus has no tools or equipment to go down into the well. The word used for well here is different in the original language than the word that we've seen before. It's more, it would, might be better translated cistern. And it emphasizes the length of the shaft. Jesus, not only do you not have tools to get any water from this well, but it's a deep, deep well. How are you going to reach all the way down there and get that water? And do you have special water that, that Jacob, our father, didn't have? Are you saying that you are better than Jacob? The answer to that question is yes. But Jesus doesn't answer so directly. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I will give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal, to eternal life. The water that Jesus gives is different in kind. The water that Jacob gave, you had to reach far down, you had to have the right tools in order to receive it. But the well that Jesus is talking about, it actually wells up. The water comes to you. You don't have to use your own efforts to obtain it. I think a lot of teachers get this passage wrong because what they say is they say that Jesus is the living water. I think Jesus would be better described in this passage as the living well. The living water is the spirit. A couple of reasons for that. that. That word welled up is used in the Old Testament sometimes to refer to the Holy Spirit when it came upon figures like Samson and Saul. But I think more importantly, later in this book, John clarifies it. He tells us exactly what it is. In John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, he says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, John clarifies, by this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So there it's stated quite plainly that the living water is the spirit. Jesus is the living well who gives the spirit. The living water is the spirit. And the spirit gives this thing called eternal life, which is 
which is eternal in both duration and in quality. We've spent some time talking about eternal life in this series, Life Beyond. And eternal, eternal life isn't just something that we, isn't just, as we said, duration of life, but it's something that we experience in the present now. It's about the quality of life that we have. It's, it's, it's something that, that satisfies our spiritual hunger. It's something that quenches our spiritual thirst. And yes, it's something that even helps us to overcome when disappointments, when they come our way. Now, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit does a lot of different things. Uh, there's a lot of different works of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. I want to just look at one today that, um, that might help us to understand the kind of life that the Holy Spirit has to offer us in those moments, particularly of disappointment. At the end of his letter to the Romans, Paul gives just a one brief sentence prayer that's pretty packed with, with ideas. And, and I want to look at that with you today. Paul says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's break this down a little bit. First of all, first of all, the Holy Spirit, we'll use a technical word, is, is, the, is God's agent. He is the means, he is the, the way that God supplies us with power. Power for what? Power to overflow with hope. That's hope when your car breaks down. That's hope when your kids do something wrong that you'd never expected. That's hope when, when you disappoint yourself and do something that you never thought that you would do that you would do. But there's something else in this verse that stirs that hope into existence. It's something else that God gives by means of the Holy Spirit as well, and it's joy and it's peace. It's joy and it's peace. Now, if that sounds strange to you, uh, you're not crazy. Because most of the world and, and many of us, we, when we think of joy, when we think of peace, we think of circumstances that, that, that make, us, make us happy, circumstances, good things that happen to us that cause us to be joyful. When we think of peace, we think of order in our lives. We think of, uh, we think of uh, a schedule that's not too busy. We think of, we think of, um, we think of inner peace. That's, we think of the kind of peace that is a life that, that is put together in ways that we would hope and expect. But some of you might also think that this sounds a little crazy simply because for you and how you were raised and, and, and your experience with God, you've always just thought that God was more of a deliverer of pain. Pain to make you achieve his, his high expectations. But joy and peace, they're part of God's character. They're gifts that he gives. If there was ever a time in your life that you experienced joy or that you experienced peace for no discernible reason, I believe that God was working in your life. I believe that that was him, no matter where you were at on your spiritual journey. But we don't experience this all the time. It can be frustrating because how, how, are, we, how are we ever supposed to obtain this? If we experience this all the time, we wouldn't be so easily sidetracked by, by the disappointments that come our way. That's why there's a couple more important words here in this verse. As you trust him. As you trust him. When we rely on God, when we trust God, when we depend on God in disappointing circumstances, what he does is he increases our capacity to experience joy no matter what the circumstance, as we trust him. And some of you might have difficulty buying into this. You might find it hard to accept. Chances are there are some of you here who have gone through some really disappointing times. And you have reached out and cried out to God and you didn't feel a whole lot different. That's chances are most everybody here is had an experience like that. 
But faith and trust is not a light switch that we turn on and we just and just stays on. Faith and trust are, are moment by moment decisions. And faith and trust are things that we have to grow into. Because all of the coping that we have done throughout all of our disappointments, we, we have learned to rely on ourselves. We have learned to trust in our own methods. And it turns out, it's actually pretty hard to let somebody else in. The Holy Spirit, one of the most mysterious things that the Holy Spirit does when we accept Jesus is that he comes and he indwells within us. I got no idea what that means. <laughs> we might need to consult a, uh, an expert in met- metaphysics. But what I think at least it, it indicates and suggests is that the Spirit becomes very close to us. That the Spirit knows us intimately and knows us really well. And the Spirit alone, He can, he can deliver on those promises as we trust Him because He knows us Better than anyone else. He knows our thoughts. He knows our feelings. Mr. Rogers in the past few years has become uh, more popular with the media. There was a recent documentary release. They're releasing a a feature film about Mr. Rogers. And in in the documentary, um, there's a scene uh, from several years ago where he's sitting with children around him. And a little boy raises his hand and he, he says, My rabbit was thrown in the washer and his ear fell off. It really wasn't a question, so I'm not sure how I would have responded in a situation like that. I suppose Mr. Rogers, he could have simply said, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, that's so, so terrible, I feel so bad for you. He could have responded that way. Or maybe he could have said, you know, aren't you thankful that toy rabbits can be fixed? But he didn't do that. His response, I thought, was a lot more interesting. He said, aren't you glad that our ears and our noses don't fall off too? Hmm. I think that there was a little bit of a giggle out in the audience and the children, they started to (laughs) pull their ears and pull their nose. In a moment of the child's disappointment, Mr. Rogers became close enough that he knew exactly what he needed to hear to bring a little bit more peace, and even in a sad situation, some, some joy for all the kids to experience. I think the Holy Spirit's like that. I think that the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is so close to us, only the Holy Spirit can know how to, to, to help us to experience joy and peace in, in moments of great disappointment like that. The Holy Spirit can, can quench our thirst and, and satisfy our hunger in the midst of those great disappointments. When we, are, when, we, when we face disappointments, we can overcome them when they come our way by trusting in the Holy Spirit who gives us joy and peace and hope no matter what our circumstances are. The story of Jesus and the, the Samaritan woman ends actually in a little bit of an interesting way. The conversation is interrupted by the disciples And the woman, she leaves. She goes to tell the townspeople about what happened. We don't really hear much after that about the Samaritan woman. But John records a really fascinating and interesting detail that that could easily be overlooked. When she left Jesus to go tell the townspeople, she left her jar behind. She, She didn't get what she needed, but she walked away. She didn't get what she came for, but she walked away with a taste of what she needed. Let's pray. God, the reality is, Lord, that um, no matter how much we do to try to protect ourselves and, and guard against disappointments, they will come. And Lord, when they come, even after those of us who have heard this message and accepted, Lord, what you said in your word, that we too will struggle and will fail to to implement these truths, God. But I pray that you would give us the courage to trust, that you would give us the vision to see how your spirit has worked in the past so that we can experience joy, so that we can be a people of joy and hope and peace 
no matter what comes our way. In Jesus' name.